do you need to work in a level one trauma center to get into CRNA school? Hey, Chrissy, do I need to work in a level one trauma center to get into CRNA school? Watch this video, send it to your friends, and tell them all to please stop asking for me. <laughs> We're answering this question once and for all. Once and for all. Guys, I love you guys so much, but I'm so tired of talking about this because it's so misunderstood. We're going to dive into everything today in this episode. We're going to talk about what is a level one trauma center, pros of a level one trauma center. Yes, it's a good thing. There are absolutely great places to work. Pros of coming from non-level one trauma centers, other types of facilities. We're going to dive into all of that today. So quick introduction. My name's Chrissy. If you don't know me, I'm a nurse anesthetist. I've been working as a CRNA for over five and a half years. Before that, I was a CBIC nurse in a level one trauma center, which plot twist is no longer the level one trauma center. We'll talk about that later. Right, crumbs. And and my name's Anna. I am a first year SRNA, finishing up my first year, actually heading to YouTube. Oh my God. And before that, I was a surgical burn tech in a level one trauma center. And then I was a CDICU nurse in a level one trauma center. And I was a travel nurse at many different facilities throughout the nation, most of which were not level one trauma centers, many of which still had high acuity. We're going to dive into all of this stuff. A lot here. of twist. So what is a level one trauma center and what is the actual like, definition? Okay, so I'm going to pull this up and read it to you guys because it's defined by the American Trauma Society as a comprehensive regional resource that is a tertiary care facility. We'll talk about what that means in a second central to the trauma system. A level one trauma center is capable of providing total care for every aspect of injury from prevention through rehabilitation. So we'll pop this, these bullet points up on the screen of all the different requirements. In summary, some of the key elements that make something a level one trauma center is 24 in-house coverage by general surgeons and prompt availability from everybody else. So we can call in a neurosurgeon, we can call in an orthopedic surgeon, we can call in a cardiac surgeon, but we need a general surgeon in-house 24-7 in case someone needs something emergently done, stat, stat, stat. They are also a referral resource for the community. So this is where sick patients get transferred into. That's what tertiary, excuse me, tertiary care means. It's like the third level of care, right? Like the highest level of care. This is where people are going to be sent to. They also have to hit different benchmarks like providing leadership and research and certain amounts of education. So those are all the different things, but that is what defines something as level one trauma. Okay, so okay. why is this a good thing? In short, if you work at a level one trauma center, you are guaranteed to be taking care of a high volume of patients and high acuity of patients, right? Because the trauma center has to be able to handle anyone who rolls through the door. So you're pretty likely to be doing the latest evidence-based medicine. It's probably an academic med medical center, meaning a teaching facility. So you're gonna be learning from some of the greatest minds and leaders in the field. You're going to be getting exposed to lots of different things, very sick patients, and you're going to have a lot of resources and support, especially if you're a new grad nurse. This is a really great learning opportunity. Does that mean you won't find acuity anywhere else? Absolutely not. And we're going to get into that in a second. Okay. Yeah, One of so. the DMs that I get every single day is, hi, Anna, is my ICU high acuity? Let's just define what high acuity is. And then please send this video amongst yourselves because I can't answer those DMs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like we love you guys, but I can't answer every single individual person about whether or not their ICU meets the criteria. So we're just going to talk through what the criteria of a high acuity unit is really quickly. All right. So if you have a unit and it is a large ICU, meaning larger than like 12 beds, right? So larger than 12 beds and about 50% of those patients are mechanically ventilated on circulatory support or receiving uh, continuous dialysis or have art lines, CVP, PA monitoring, or, and or are on multiple vasopressors. Yes. So if you have an ICU and it is 12 beds and six of those patients are intubated, sedated on multiple vasopressors and plus or minus devices, that's a high acuity unit. If you have a 30 bed unit and 24 of those beds are taken up by PCU patients, that is not a high acuity unit. 
PCU, meaning progressive care. Like yeah. progressive care. Step down patients, walkie talkie. Yes. Like, yes, it's technically an ICU, but almost everyone is actually fine. What you're looking for is a unit where you personally are going to be taking the assignments of the sick patients. So are you as a bedside nurse consistently managing vasopressors, consistently taking patients who have the advanced invasive monitoring? Are you admitting post-op surgical patients or um, patients who are crashing down from the floor of your medical ICU? Are you taking the post-op surgery patients if you are neurosurgery or neurotrauma? If you are checking the boxes that, yes, at least 50% of my patient assignments in a given week are intubated, sedated, on mechanical circulatory support, on more than two vasopressors, and I frequently titrate those vasopressors, you have high acuity experience. Agree. Oh, if you often are coming in for the post-op day three patients, you're pulling lines and drains, you're sending them to the floor, you're not taking post-ops, you are not the nurse that is the go-to for the bounce backs from the floor for the patient who needs an RSI, you may still be working on a high acuity unit, but you are not personally taking high acuity assignments. So there is a little bit of nuance here of you need to be working somewhere that has sick patients and you need to be taking those sick patient assignments. Ooh, okay. So I want to add an addendum to this. This is another DM I get a lot. <laughs> Brand spanking new grads will come off orientation and they're DMing me in a panic. Hey, all these sick patients are on my unit, but I'm not taking these patients yet. Like, do I need to transfer out to somewhere that's going to throw me in with the sickest patients? And I want to cry when I see those messages because no, that's a good thing. If you're a new grad nurse, you have to crawl before you walk. I know that there are some students who occasionally get into CRNA school with a year of ICU experience, but they are the exception, not the rule. It is not the norm in most places. Take a deep breath, slow down. The assignments will come to you. I promise. It also circles back. We talk about this pretty frequently to this is about patient safety and patient outcomes and not padding your resume to get into grad school as quickly as possible. Right. You need to learn how to be a critical care nurse before you learn how to be a critical and an advanced practice registered nurse who is responsible for the airways and hemodynamic support of a patient in the operating room. Right. And this circles back once again to if you are lucky enough to work in a place that has a strong union and has good staffing you're probably not going to be taking those really critical patient assignments as quickly as you're working somewhere that has really high turnover and really bad patient outcomes. And that's the thing too. It's not going to be a safe place for your license. It's going to burn you out more quickly because that's probably a place with poor working conditions. And it's not going to be safe for your patients. I'm sorry. It's just you're still learning how to change the sheets with a patient in it yeah. while you're learning to titrate vasopressors while you're learning to do wound care you know throwing you on ecmo right away it's just not really optimal for anyone so be patient slow down take a deep breath we love you guys it's okay it's also i think important to look at the data and you can look at the coa crna school comparison tool you can also look at the mbcrna website that's where you can see the data on all the matriculants and all of the graduating SRNAs and their first time forwards pass rates correlated to the type of ICU experience that they had and age at the time of matriculation. The average matriculating SRNA, meaning first year SRNA, has an average of 3.5 years of experience. Yes. Some of you will be the exception, but not all. There are very many people who think that they're going to go in with one year of ICU experience and get in. And the numbers show that that's not realistic. And it is not unkind to make you all aware of those kind of statistics. And I think it also helps take the pressure off because sometimes what you see online presented is the exception rather than the general rule. So you may know somebody you got in with one year of experience, but I think you shouldn't put pressure on yourself to meet that timeline. Slow down, enjoy the process, and enjoy the learning. It's going to be a nurse. I would have even maybe liked one more year. I started CRNA school at three years. I could have done another year of travel and really enjoyed it. And I'm really grateful that I didn't start any earlier. I think starting at the three-year mark was perfect for me. But I would have even enjoyed another year of travel nursing, honestly. Honestly, so this is, you know, 
my own personal experience, the school, I talk about this all the time, the school's in the Philadelphia area. So I was living in Philly and for family reasons, I needed to stay in the Philadelphia area. So I was not looking outside of that geographical region. They have long wait lists to get in. Mm-hmm. Um, Villano- they Oftentimes they do something called rolling admissions, meaning you can apply whenever and then you interview whatever, and then you just wait your turn to take your seat. You just like get in the queue. You just get on the backlog. Like, hey, we filled the 2023 class. We filled the 2024 class. You're going to be in line for the fall of 2025 class. Great. Great. Um, so um, that's how Villanova does things, which was my top choice school. Then my second choice school, LaSalle, which is the Frank Tornetta school. I, I don't know what's happening with that program now at the time of this podcast filming. Um, I should probably look into it. But what they did, which was really interesting, was you would get in right away, but you would have about three years worth of taking your master's and like now DNP courses ahead of time that were non-anesthesia related before you could sit for the actual, and then you would like join an anesthesia cohort. So they were also like a three-year wait before you start the physical bulk of your CRNA program and actually quit your job. So that was another great option because I figured either way, I have like two and a half to three years of working, saving money. Maybe I'll travel nurse like my last year. I had a whole plan lined up. And then I ended up being convinced by a friend to throw in an application at the last second to the University of Pennsylvania. I didn't want to do it because it was one of the most expensive programs in the country, but they only had a one year wait. I was at my 18 month mark of being a nurse at the time. I said, okay, like I'll be a nurse for like almost three years. Like it, and it's not, to- the money might be tight, but at least I'll be a CRNA sooner. And it was supposed to be their last year of their master's program, the class I was applying for. So I said, okay, with the DNP change coming up, even though it's expensive, like by the time I start Villanova, by the time I start LaSalle, there'll be DNP programs tuition rises every year, it's going to get more expensive anyway. So this was kind of like a it was a very strategic decision to just throw in this application at the last second. I get a call about a month later and the, um, I can't think of what her, the administrative assistant, she calls me and she's like, can you come down this weekend for an interview? We're only calling people who live in the area. We have some last minute openings for the class that would start next month so i have like four days to prepare for this interview i hadn't even like finished filling out my applications to villanova or lasalle yet like i didn't think an interview was coming my way for another year um (laughs) and then i was like oh my god i might start in like four and a half weeks that's (laughs) wild so i go down i interview somehow i get in and i started four weeks later as a nurse with 19 months of experience. I had regretted so much for that first, I'd say year of the program, not waiting another year. Mm. It was such a steep learning curve for me. I'm a very smart person. I'm a very hard worker. I agree. I came from, (laughs) I came from a really high acuity unit. Some would argue like one of them as high acuity as you can get. I had a lot of amazing experiences in a very short amount of time that did help prepare me and amazing nurse educators. I made all the resources at my disposal to succeed and I utilized them. But, oh my God, just putting the whole big picture together and like seeing things in their full context just takes time. And even though I was able to do it, I struggled so much more in clinical than some of my classmates with more experience did, at least in the beginning. Once I hit a certain point where I feel like it clicked, I was fine after that. But I'd say in the first six months of clinical, I felt like an idiot every day. I got screamed out in the OR. I cried one time. (laughs) I'm a rough go of it. (laughs) Abusing students is it okay? It's okay. It happens. (laughs) One, one lady took my patient's LMA and ripped it out and threw it across the room and made me mask ventilate the rest of the case by <laughs> What? <laughs> These are the things I have to look forward to. It, TBD, whether my experience is going to help me or not. I'm hoping that the extra year of experience will be helpful during the incredibly difficult transition to clinical 
But I'm personally glad, even on the didactic side, that I didn't start a year earlier. Yeah, because of an, just a multitude of things. And during my travel experience during 2020, I worked neuro ICU. I did the all of the stroke screenings. We did TPA. I had the neuro traumas, the lumbar drains, and the C and the ICP monitoring. I wouldn't have had that if I had not traveled. Uh, DKA management, a bunch of sepsis patients, all of these things that. I think we're really helpful and foundational as I go into anesthesia because to have a little bit of familiarity with the pathophysiology coming in, it all helps. And also just being a little more flexible because I think coming only from a very rigid CD CQ background, I think I would have struggled with inflexible thinking. So I'm really grateful for my travel experience as I'm coming in, but I also don't know anything yet. So we'll see. We kind of sidetracked here. This is getting in back into the question of we defined what high acuity unit is. Now the next thing is, do you need to work into in a level one trauma center to get into CRNA school? No. <laughs> the answer is no. The answer is no. I think the biggest confusion here is that people, like they get so obsessed with like the flashiness of a level one trauma center. But first and foremost, you can get that ultra high acuity academic medical tertiary care experience without it being a trauma center. So the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania is the first example, and Cleveland Clinic is the second example. These are two of like the top hospitals in the country. They have some of the best cardiac surgery programs in the country. And if you work on any unit in those hospitals, their medical ICU, their neuro ICU, their SICU, you're getting some of the you know latest and greatest, best experience you can get, just like any level one trauma center. Why are they not considered level one trauma centers? There's no trauma there. The trauma goes down the street to some sister hospital. So don't get caught up in only thinking you can work in these places. And that's why we showed the classification of what differentiates a level one versus a level two. Oh yeah, here, we're gonna pop up on the screen level two now. Here's level two. You can see that it's almost exactly the same. You still have 24 hour immediate coverage by general surgery and all of these specialties. Yeah. So for and certain specialties, they're allowed to transfer out and still be okay. considered a level two. So for cardiac surgery, they can transfer out. Okay. Some of the things here is just the nuance that's added that sometimes the only difference between a level two and a level one is ER volume. And if you're working specifically cardiac surgery, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect you. What the ER volume is to you because you guys are doing cardiac surgery cases. Like exactly. ER volume doesn't matter. And this is where... Again, circling back to what's the definition of high acuity, like 50% of the patients are intubated, sedated, va ventilated, and you're managing inotropes, vasopressors, and plus or minus devices, circulatory su support. Right. So this is where knowing what high acuity patient assignments look like is the important thing here. It doesn't really matter if you are cardiac, what the ER volume is. It does, however, matter if you're working in a trauma ICU, Another example, I worked at Johns Hopkins as my new grad job. Our surgical trauma ICU at the time only was running eight beds. Because why? All of the traumas were going to shock trauma. Right, it's right on the street. Shock trauma, like one of the biggest trauma hospitals in the nation, was right across the street. Why would they come to Hopkins? Exactly. So again, the trauma designation, I would never sit here and say that our insanely high volume cardiac surgery program wasn't high acuity because the traumas went down the street. Right. <laughs> it's, just, it's just so not relevant to you as a MICU nurse right. or a neuro nurse. Like it just doesn't have to do with you. Right. So yes, if you're in a level one trauma center, because of the requirements to be considered a level one trauma center, all of the units will have, you know, the ability to take care of any patient. So you're likely to get high acuity. But just because you don't have trauma there or you're not a level one trauma center doesn't mean you can't have a high acuity MICU pick you, sick you, ick you, ick you, ick you, right? It's just, yes. it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with you. We're going to do like a, a full 180 and talk about people with the exact opposite experience. Mm -hmm. What about nurses who come from like more rural facilities, smaller facilities? You've been an ICU nurse for five years and you're in like, you know, a combined make you sick you with 10 beds. Like, do these people have a chance of getting into CRNA school? Yes. yes. <laughs> I think it's more bad. No. Yes. Oh, yes. I, I think this is important because people 
are coming in looking to get into CRNA school and they want cookie cutter answers to everything, it's not cookie cutter. But there are lots of nurses, some of, and again, like super strong clinicians who come from a variety of backgrounds. Totally. And that's something that's really valued in anesthesia is a variety of clinical backgrounds and then different strengths and weaknesses. So let's talk about the tiny rural community hospital and how like nurses from who like not your academic medical centers, what, how could you be prepared to apply to CRNA school with kind of non-traditional experience? I could think of a perfect example. When I was a new grad nurse, the job market was the opposite of what it is now. You could not find a nursing job because it was post-2008 recession. The year the year was 2013. And there were no nursing jobs anywhere. I applied to over 100 jobs in three different states. I was applying to nursing homes. I was applying to any med surge units, rehabs. If it was a nursing job, if it had the word RN in it, you bet my application was there. I'm frustrated already. <laughs> I got an interview at this little hospital called Pinnacle in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So that's how far out in PA I had to go to like find a job. Wow. It was a combined medical surgical ICU. I think it had like 10 beds, definitely less than 20. It was small. Um, they had a really amazing education program to train new grads. The nurses there, uh, once you had a little bit of experience, you could join the rapid response team. So they went to all the codes in the hospitals the only larger center in the area to transfer out to would be Hershey. So a lot of times they would take patients from the community and stabilize them and hold them like until they could get transported out to a higher level of care. And they still did have a decent amount of patients on mechanical ventilators and you know advanced hemodynamic monitoring and vasopressor support. So yeah, they're not getting like all these crazy patients all the time. Yeah, a lot of the patients were stable, but they had a lot of good resources, support, and opportunities for you to really develop your skills as a nurse. A lot of these times, the smaller facilities like this, I'm not sure if this is the case for that specific hospital, so please like, don't quote me on it. I'm just, I'm talking about other hospitals now in general of like a similar nature. A lot of the times there's no physician coverage overnight. Mm. There's no ICU doc in-house. I know one of the community hospitals I used to take overnight call in, our only airway backup. So we would go there and do 24 hour airway coverage because there was no doctors overnight to do it or APPs at the time that like were comfortable intubating. We eventually like trained them and then like left that role. But the only person who could intubate in the whole hospital at the time was one ER doc. So if wow. the ER doc was busy and there was a code, like the nurses ran the code alone. Eventually they got APP coverage, but and then the CRNA would come and like put in the lines and intubate. That's a lot of autonomy. Yeah, could you imagine being a nurse and like just running the codes overnight and like you just call the ICU doc from home and just like let them know what's happening. Like it might take them an hour to get there. I can't imagine because of COVID. She can imagine. I hadn't, can in fact imagine. Yeah, uh, actually, I would love to hear more about like when you were in those like more community hospitals, how your, I mean, COVID was obviously like a very unique example because yeah. it was so, it was an extreme circumstance of no resources, but a similar scenario kind of could come up in any under-resourced environment, right? This is where I learned a lot as a nurse, two of the very small community hospitals that I worked at. The first one, there was five ICUs and the doc covered the ER and the five ICUs. There was one physician, one, no APPs. You did everything. Well, this was also COVID, but we were, you know, running the show and then having him co-sign everything when we saw him next. So this was the level of patients were really sick. They needed interventions and you had to be pretty clear at advocating and communicating and then getting things started and getting the ball rolling, which is very different from the hand-holding and the micromanaging of these very large academic medical centers. Right. So this is a, hey, my patient, uh, the septic patient, I restarted. I, I grabbed Lebo and we have Neo, and I don't know if you want to get an echo as well because they just got admitted something, something, something. And then that's a yes, yes, yes versus a, Anna, you need to go down by 0.5 on your happy. It, it's a very different level of what's expected from the nursing staff. Right. Oh, at the same time, this was within the context of 2020 where things were very suboptimal to say the least. But community hospitals do operate like that at baseline. One doctor covering four ICUs, 
they can't be everywhere at the same time. Exactly. And you're going to expect the nurses to be able to operate pretty independently and then work collaboratively to take care of the patients. And the communication has to be more clear and direct. And you have to know what you're doing, honestly. Another factor that people tend to neglect, everybody thinks the sickest patients only exist in like urban academic medical centers. Not true. People forget that the sickest patients on the planet are the ones who don't typically have access to care. So these are patients in, you know, the poorer parts of cities, right? Like more under, uh, just under resourced areas in general, right? Anytime people don't have money or health insurance, they're, what? Where they're working free jobs and they don't have time to go to the doctor or have transportation. They're sick. They're not managing their chronic illness. If they live in a rural area, there's no physicians for hours away, right? Like they're sick. They're not managing their chronic illness. They don't even know they have it. So these people are coming in and they're still getting septic. They're still getting hit by cars. They're still getting heart attacks. And you're in the middle of this, you know, this area where you might have to wait hours until they can be transported out or they might not get transported out at all. And you're in charge of handling it. So it's very easy for people to make these cookie cutter statements like, oh, you have to work in a level one trauma center. But there's nurses who come from all sorts of different backgrounds with all different sorts of strengths and learning opportunities everywhere you go if you create them. So that brings us into our next point. Which, in summary so far, working at a level one trauma center is great. You do not have to work at a level one trauma center to get into CRNA school. You can have really high acuity patients anywhere because America is a very sick country. <laughs> Everybody's sick. <laughs> Everyone is extremely sick. You can also create opportunity for yourself to learn almost anywhere. And what are some ways that you can create opportunities to learn in kind of non-cookie cutter tertiary medical centers? And how can you really prepare yourself for CRNA school in that way? I think the first example would be just like those nurses at uh, Pinnacle. I think starting like a or joining or starting a rapid response team or a code team where you're going down to the med surge floors and caring for patients who, again, like even less monitoring, even less background on that, like going and responding to those things is going to teach you so much. You're going to see more sick patients more often and learn how to make decisions in more unique environments. So go check out our podcast episode about assessment because this really brings that to mind, talking yeah. about a rapid response. When you show up to a tele or a med search floor with an unmonitored patient who's headed in a not so good direction, all you have is your physical assessment of this patient because you're gonna have to wait for imaging and you're gonna have to wait for labs. So what does your nursing assessment tell you about what the next steps are for this patient? Go check out that episode because really nursing assessment is so key. It is really going to prepare you really well for CRNA school. Absolutely. I Did you know that I was a rapid response nurse in California? Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Well, you know, desperate times, but I <laughs> think it was the best they had at the time, I guess. But there was times as a travel nurse where I was working on the rapid response team and we would go and you have to, with very little resources and information about a patient, do a pretty solid physical assessment and make a plan of care and advocate pretty hard to get ICU placement for patients if they need it. Yeah. Or do interventions at the spot or like on the fly for patients who are very, very sick. Oh, absolutely. And this is great experience for CRNA school specifically because a lot of CRNAs cover airway call and we're going to those rapid responses as well and also making similar decisions like, do they need to be intubated now? Can they wait to go to the ICU? Can we initiate BiPAP or CPAP? Like you're making these assessments and decisions and advocating and making the phone call. So having that experience as a nurse is actually like a great little preview. Like I never did any of that stuff until CRNA school. Now I'm just like, it's so funny to me thinking like, oh man, like that would have been so beneficial to me as a nurse. So that's going to be really helpful for you later down the road. Oh, hopefully I have to pass my classes first to know pass anatomy first. Okay, yeah. Okay. It's just great. <laughs> He's just paranoid about it. <laughs> CRNA school is stressful, folks. But there are other ways you can create opportunities for yourself. I know a lot of people who do IVT. That's a great way to go and, like, it's a good skill set, first of all. But then it's a good way to be a resource for your hospital and to pursue leadership. You don't have to work at a large academic medical center to do, like, one shift a month where you're doing IVs throughout the hospital. That's, like, a fun little skill set. That's kind of cool. Rapid response, I think, is more relevant. Yeah, I would say other ways would be like starting committees. Like if you could start an evidence-based practice committee, you could do that in any hospital on the planet or a research project and or a quality improvement project and or an overlap of all of these things. But 
you know, okay, so you're in an ICU where people aren't that cynic, yada, yada, yada. Well, I bet they're still getting infections. I bet they're still getting wounds. I bet you guys are still doing stuff with your sedation that you probably shouldn't be doing. Go watch a lot of and pain control podcasts. <laughs> it's my pet peeve. I'm sorry. Um, sedation is not the same thing as pain control. It's not. So, you know, these different things, if you can make a change in practice on your unit and improve patient outcomes, that is going to look so cool for CRNA school. People are going to be really impressed that you've taken initiative, you identified a problem, like you've done the research, you've made a change, and then now patients are having better outcomes. So, okay, you don't have a bleeding post-op cardiac surgery patient every day, but you are extremely knowledgeable, skilled, a patient advocate. You see a problem and you know how to implement change. That's a really huge part of your practice of anesthesia as well. Staying on top of the latest evidence-based practice is crucial as a CRNA. A lot of times you're working independently or semi-independently as a CRNA, even in these like, you know, anesthesia care teams, you're going back and forth making complex decisions about patients. You have to know what the latest research is. So being able to implement that is going to show that you're capable of thinking outside the box. You don't just do what you're told. You're an independent thinker and a go-getter. So join a committee, create a committee, do a research project. Um, you can get, if you're in a place, let's say like, you can't leave your family. Your ICU is not high acuity. You're really not getting like such great experience. This is like kind of a crazy idea here, but maybe you'll love it. Get your RN paramedic. Go do some pre-hospital stuff. I actually, did you know I was an EMT at one point? <laughs> oh, how cute for like a shift. <laughs> I got my EMT certification. I rode the ambulance like one time ever. And then I actually um, got into the study abroad program in Mexico and I left and I studied abroad in Mexico instead. And I like never went back to the fire out. I feel like we were robbed of the Chrissy e CRNA, Chrissy EMT era. I feel like I was robbed as well, <laughs> but I learned a lot. I met some really cool people. I enjoyed my one shift on the episode, <laughs> but I know a lot of um, like nurses who do EMS as well. Actually, what is her username on TikTok? She's like one of the cutest nurses, but she stepped away from TikTok because she's doing her paramedic training right now and she's very busy. Why am she's I blonde? Why am I freaking and she's from the Midwest. Reading her handle. But I know this God, I love her, but she's really cool. It's such a good way to supplement like critical care experience, right? Like and this is why see all this different stuff. Flight nursing. So a lot of our shifts, a lot of flight nursing requires you to have your paramedic. Yeah, you usually have to. Yeah. This will be dependent on which agency employs you. And then this is also one of those nuanced things where we made a video, you can go check it out, about do about non-traditional application and admission into CRNA school. If you look on the COA CRNA website, you can actually see there that there are a few SRNAs every single year who are admitted with primarily like flight and ER experience. And that's where the kind of ICU paramedic ER train looks. You will, however, see then that it's like, I believe it's four out of the 200 some or the 2000 SRNAs every single year. So it's not many, but there is some high ex high acuity experience out there for the flight nurses, paramedics, the pre-hospital critical care management of patients. So this is one of those creating opportunities for yourself. This is not a pathway that I'm necessarily going to put a stamp of approval on because I think it works out for so few people, but it is critical care and it is high acuity. And there are some amazing CRNAs out there who have gone along that pathway. But again, this is just about understanding and understanding what opportunities are available for you, opening doors for yourself, and then learning a lot along the way, right? We're not like recommending that you replace ICU experience with ER or like paramedic slash flight experience because most schools actually do not accept ER. Like, you know, if you're an ER nurse and you want to go to CRNA school, the recommendation 100% of the time for everyone is please get into an ICU, and then you can start applying, right? There are exceptions in the past. Programs have definitely been more open to ER, but it's becoming a rarer and rarer exception. So please don't think that we're saying that this should replace your ICU experience. But if you're an ICU nurse and you're concerned that you're not getting enough acuity, get creative is what we're saying. Exactly. Adding on to that, more importantly, going back to that same theme we talked about in the prerequisite video. So if you haven't seen that, it's the episode before this one. Do you like what prerequisites do you need to take for CRNA school? We'll link it below. You are more than the sum of your parts. Mm -hmm. Program directors are going to look at an entire application package. 
So we talked about the student with a non-competitive GPA and different ways they can help boost that to show that they're ready for Sierra Renee School. One of the ways to pad your application package and like one of the key parts of your application is your ICU experience. I would argue it's probably the most important part of your application package, like showing that you are ready to take on the challenges of anesthesia by taking on high acuity patients in one way or another. So whether that means you were in a rural area and running codes by yourself overnight, even though it wasn't very high volume, or by showing that you worked in a level one trauma center or a Cleveland clinic or something like that, right? In some capacity, whatever that capacity looks like, you took on high acuity patients, weren't able to get those experiences because of your life circumstances, whatever's going on, show ingenuity, show resourcefulness, show that you dug deeper and did something. Also, you can, again, pad with like other experiences, attend conferences, show that you're very serious about this career, get tons of shadowing hours. A lot of people only have their minimum number of shadowing hours for the school. There are applicants who find ways to network and they get like hundreds of shadowing hours. Do you remember that girl we had from our application focus group? She like managed to network with various CRNAs around the country. And I think she met some of them. One of them was like a friend of a friend, but another one I think she met through like a conference. She got like hundreds of shadowing hours. That was incredible. Nobody does that. I mean, that would be so stand out to me if I was a program director. So there's different ways to get creative and show that you are a whole person. Optimizing your personal statement. Just having a really good essay can be enough to get you your foot in the door. And then practicing with mock interviews to have a really good interview. Like all of these things are going to help help you stand apart. So that little mini course that we did on getting into CRNA school, we actually have recorded and saved in the CCA membership now. So CCA members can go to the future CRNA folder and watch the videos on how to optimize your application package. So that's what we're talking about, like all these different things you can do to get into an IC, um, excuse me, to get into a CRNA program if something is lacking in your package. So definitely check out those videos. This is in addition to the Casale Expanding Library that we have of critical care and anesthesia and pharmacology topics and travel nursing topics. All of that is at our paid monthly membership, Confident Care Academy membership. So go check that out. All of the CRNA admissions lectures are in the membership as well for you guys to check out. Yes, linked below for your convenience. Those critical care lectures and that pharmacology library, key to nailing your CRNA interview. Yes. I'm a little biased, but people, we know women getting some badass feedback. We no longer do mock interviews. We did that a little bit last year. No, I hate them. <laughs> you guys are great, but I can't. It is not my wheelhouse. Uh, we now refer mock interviews to our friends, Dr. Jason Bolt, and to CRNA Method. CRNA Method, yeah. yeah. Stacey's they're, amazing. They love it. They're incredible. We no longer do it, but the clinical and pharmacology preparation piece check out the membership as well, because that's where you're going to see the QA Dynamics monitoring lectures, your all of your pharmacology mini lectures, like all that stuff is so key for your interview. It's key for your interview, but it's also key for your foundations for like helping you in school in general. I mean, yeah. I know you're biased. It's been so helpful as an SRNA. I am already, I, I understand just, you know, GABA receptors now. It's really helpful for me to know by calcium channel blockers that there's multiple different classes and then some affect the SANAV node, others dull. And these are the sort of things that it just helps as I'm getting into anesthesia because anesthesia, it's not just pharmacology. It's chemistry, physics, anatomy, physiology, and anesthesia, every single class all at the same time. So it's been so, so helpful to be writing these lectures with Chrissy as I'm going through school myself. And it has been like such a helpful, just a, not even refresher, but just getting at that deeper level. It's one level deeper than ICU nursing. And it's very similar to my CRNA school curriculum. Yeah, it's like just a smidge below what you're going to get in CRNA school. So it's been so fun to go through that process writing with Chrissy, who does cardiac CRNA, cardiac anesthesia, who has all this knowledge. It's been really helpful to be writing all of these lectures while I'm going through school at the same time. So if you're somebody who is looking to get a head start on CRNA school and you want to get a little bit of a deeper basis of knowledge before you start, the Coffee Care Academy membership is for you as well. Check out our next video about uh, getting new grad jobs at the ICU and check out all of our previous video, pain and sedation, travel nursing before CRNA school, and ICU nursing versus CRNA compensation. We've got a lot of stuff for you guys. Go check it out. See you next time.